So hello everyone. Um, on behalf of the Trinity Centre for Literary and Cultural Translation, I would like to welcome you all to our book club this evening. Our book club meets every month during term to discuss a piece of recently translated literature. And in the past four years, our book club has been, has reviewed books translated from over 20 different languages and writing from 35 countries. Our book this evening is the acclaimed masterpiece, Family Lexicon, Natalia Ginsberg's autobiographical novel published in 1963 when she was 47 years old. The book's first translation by D.M. Lowe, The Things We Used to Say, was published in 1967. A second translation, Family Sayings by Judith Wolfe, was published in 1997. And the book's most recent translation, Family Lexicon by Jenny McPhee, was published in 2018. This book club will have a slightly different format to our usual meetings. This is because we have two very special guests this evening whose insight and mastery of literary translation from Italian into English will con contribute greatly to our discussion. And we have therefore made many more places available for the event than we would normally. I would first like to welcome Professor Cormac O'Quillanon, who will be very well known to many of you. Cormac was the head of the Italian department here at Trinity College for many years. He was a founder member of the Irish Translators and Interpreters Association. His main areas of research are Boccaccio, Dante, translation and creative writing. In addition to his academic work, Cormac is a translator and a writer. I would also like to welcome Jenny McPhee. Jenny is a widely published novelist and translator. In addition to books by Natalia Ginsberg, she has translated works by Primo Levi, Anna Maria Ortese, Curzio Malaparte, Paolo Marensig, and Pope John Paul II. Yeah. Jenny is an administrator and faculty member at NYU, and she has taught at Princeton and and the European School of Literary Translation. Jenny was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2020. We warmly welcome any questions, comments, and observations that you have about the book and its translation. You may ask questions by raising your hand, to not the fashioned way, but to do this, if you could click on the reactions button that you'll see on the bottom right of your screen and choose the raise hand option. If you prefer not to be put on the spot, you can also ask questions using the chat box if you prefer. So I'd ask you all to please stay on mute unless you are actually speaking, in which case, please try to remember to unmute. This does improve the overall sound quality for everybody. We would also encourage you to keep your cameras on so that we are not talking to uh, a series of black boxes, but it's also fine if you're busy doing something else and you prefer to switch your camera off. And finally, I just would like to remind you that this meeting is being recorded and a redacted version may be uploaded to our website at a later date. But for now, I would like to hand the floor over to Cormac and to Jenny. And I would like to thank you both again for being here this evening. Cormac. Thank you. So many thanks, Esna, for setting this up. And thanks to all of you for taking part. Uh, can I be heard? Yes. Good, yeah. good, good. Okay. Now, when Eamon Linsky mentioned Lessico Familiare at the last book club meeting, it struck me what a, a very interesting set of translation problems Natalia Ginsburg had posed for her future translators. Family Lexicon 1963 is challenging from several angles, the strange private language spoken by her family, but also the deceptive simplicity of the author's style which wanders around in associative circles and yet somehow manages to be hugely resonant and poetic. The book has been translated into English and now American three times, 1967, 1997, and recently. And this is partly because translation involves reading as well as writing, and every new age reads with its own eyes. The first of the three translators was born in the reign of Queen Victoria, which is neither today nor yesterday, while the latest, Jenny McPhee, is a contemporary uh, American translator and novelist. 
apart from the purely translation problems in family lexicon, there are all those people we're supposed to know. Ginsburg's opening cast of characters, mostly Jewish socialist intellectuals in Turin, includes heroic and tragic figures, but she refuses to document their historic achievements or situate them in public. Instead, she looks up at them, close up as a child might, registering their foibles, their occasional silliness, their hopes, their affections, and their habits. You'd never guess from this book that Adriano Olivetti was a leading European industrialist, nor that Natalia's father, Giuseppe or Beppino, was a great scientific educator, three of whose students went on to, to win Nobel Prizes. You wouldn't guess that her elder brother Gino saved many anti-fascists from the Nazis at the end of the war. Her reticence, her understatement in these matters actually adds to the book's impressive stature. What she has to offer is a sense of their personal lives and of the human cost that they, that they paid for their beliefs. Being captured or being sent into exile is presented not as a great heroic deed, but as a great damn nuisance because the domestic scale is always there to measure the political and public moments. But what a cast of characters she has. Peppino, the patriarch, an awkward cuss, irascible, domineering, prejudiced, and terribly authoritative, except that he leaves the actual headship of, his fam of the family to his wife. From Natalia's description, I pictured a huge, gigantic, ebullient ogre of a man, yet here he is, neat and slim and inoffensive. And that's the two of them together. This is the latest version of PowerPoint you would be interested to know. When Beppino heard that his daughter was writing an autobiographical, he wrote her a letter. I hope you're not going to bring dishonor on our family. When he read the finished book, he was angry and amused. But I don't shout like that. It's not true at all. Natalia says almost nothing about her husband, Leone, his courage and their love, but we can infer a great deal, including just from, the, the, from her silences. They had not been married for very many years when he was arrested, tortured and murdered in a jail in Rome by the, by the Nazis. Then there's her big sister, Paola, wife of Adriano Olivetti and lover of the famous author Carlo Levi, among others. Paola is presented not as a great beauty and femme fatale, but as a slightly daffy character, easily bored, supportive to her mother, to whom she gives sound fashion advice. Here she is with Adriano. Saved Natalia's life after her husband's arrest in Rome. And what about the author herself, Natalia? She remains something, she retains something of the naive observer, the wide eyed kid that we met in the opening pages. That last child in a noisy household, the one who needs to keep quiet and alert, taking in everything and everybody. She doesn't always say very much. Her German translator and biographer, Maya Flug, claims that she made the shortest speeches ever recorded in the Italian parliament. In an essay, she attributes her quick lapidary style to never being able to get a word in edgeways while her family sits at the table arguing. This point was made forcefully by Jenny McPhee, our guest translator, in a very interesting symposium at New York University where Jenny teaches. That symposium is on YouTube and can be Googled at translation women and Italian literature. Translation women and Italian literature has a number of distinguished participants. Natalia Ginsburg's innocent persona, her unassuming style, give this wonderful book a great deal of its emotional impact and its literary quality, which Jenny McPhee, McPhee captures so well. Here is what Italo Calvino once said about, about Ginsburg's writing style. She constructs the psychology of her characters through their behavior, 
never commenting or interpreting in an intellectual way. That's the secret of, Natalie, of Natalie's simplicity. The voice that says me is always looking at characters that she takes to be superior to herself. And faced with situations that appear too complex for her abilities, and the language and the concepts that she used to describe these people are always a bit too weak to do the job. But it's this imbalance that creates the poetic tension of her work. Poetry, Calvino concludes, poetry has always been about filtering the ocean through a funnel. Well, here is a pic another picture from Maya Flug's autobiography. Sorry, biography. Natalia here is aged about eight and ready to face the world. Her innocent gaze takes everything in. Well, that's enough for me. As we throw the discussion open, could I start by inviting the translator to tell us something about the joys and challenges of this particular or peculiar translation project? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Cormac. Thank you all for letting me be here. I'm just so thrilled to um, have anything to do with this book. And when I hear that there's a book group, I just wanna join. So I quickly got in touch with the organizers and said, can I come? So really I'm here because I wanna hear mostly from you. Um, and I wanna hear you, you know, answer your questions or just hear what you guys thought about the book. But I will just uh, give you a little story about um, when I translated, first translated this book, it was 20, uh, I think I finished it in 2013. And there was a problems with the um, rights. So I actually thought it might never get published, but it was such a great experience to translate it. Um, Ginsburg having been for me, how I first got into learning Italian. She was one of the first books I ever read in Italian. Um, so it, it was very, it was a wonderful experience for me, but then I thought, oh, it might never get published. Finally, uh, the right situation did work out and it was actually published in 2016 after the election so in the United States. So a book that for me was very relevant and always very relevant to our times became quadruple, I mean, just exponentially relevant. And um, so when I read it again after three years, that became for me, uh, and, and actually this book just keeps getting more relevant. Um, uh, the other thing was that after putting it aside for three years and then picking it back up and reading it over, I was, I had an experience which I really rarely, rarely have. And it was just complete joy and pride after reading the whole thing over. I was so, the book just sang to me and I thought, you know, this is, the, I was so, it's one of the few things besides my children that I'm really truly proud of, of being involved with. So, um, so that's why I'm, I'm just so thrilled to, to be here. So any questions that you have, I'm just really happy to answer them. And please do use the chat or raise your hand or. I, I do know that there was a question um, a very tricky question was that, do we have that question to read or should I just approach it? Ursula, I think that question might have been from you. It might be a good question to kick off. Me. Okay, I didn't, I didn't really want to kick things off, but anyway. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Uh, thank you very much. That was really interesting. And it's, it's fantastic that you were you're so positive about it when you finished the process of translation, that, that's really, really great. It's a, it's a lovely feeling, I imagine. Um, yeah, I was just, I, I mean, it's a very obvious question in lots of ways, but it's, it's the question of negri and how to deal with the word negri. And I know that the father, as Cormac says, is a kind of irascible, you know, larger than life and um, prejudiced character. So that in some ways sort of excuses him in inverted commas, but it's a problematic thing, especially nowadays and especially in our time. And I was thinking of something like, say, the, uh, the Huckleberry Finn scenario on the curriculum, certainly in American schools, for instance, it's not teachable anymore. 
because of the kind of language that it uses around race. And I'm wondering, you know, to what extent Ginsburg is problematic in that respect. And I have to say, I, I taught Ginsburg, I taught Lesco Familiare for years in University College Dublin. And uh, I gave up teaching it a few years ago for a number of reasons, but one of them actually did have to do with the problematic vocabulary around race in the novel. It wasn't the only reason, there were lots of other reasons. And I do still teach Ginsburg and I do teach other works. And I love her work and I love Lesico Familiare as well. But I think it's a, it's a real hurdle that you have to cross or it's a real problem that you have to deal with. So I was just wondering, you know, what, what you felt about that and how you handled it and, and, and how you feel about it now, I suppose. It's a wonderful question, Ursula, because you can imagine. OK, so here I'm translating this author who has, has, was extremely important in my life. And here on the very first page is this racial slur. And I want everybody to love her just as much as I love her. So I had to, it was, it was a wonderful challenge for a translator. So I had to, and this was, this is true about Ginsburg in general. You gotta, you gotta go deep because she's always doing something very profound. And so I researched how that word was used. And it came, and there's somebody in, you know, it's a, in, in Venice who says, yes, um, this word was used, but it was never used really as a racial slur. It was just used to, to mean, you know, idiot or a stupid person or, um, but I didn't really buy that. And in fact, other translations avoided it completely. But I knew that if, Natalia Ginsburg was putting that word on the very first page several times of her book. She was doing it with a uh, real purpose and very deliberately. So I um, realized as I kept, you know, translating the book that, that this was because Ginsburg's whole book is really about uh, you know, fascism and uh, patriarchal structures and oppression and the domestic sphere. And how does, uh, what her message in this book really is, fin finally, I mean, there's a lot of messages and so on, but that if we continue to allow, uh, you know, racial, what, my, what we call microaggressions or um, things that are seemingly not oppressive or the father yelling at the daughter so, so much that she doesn't even finish college. If we continue to allow these uh, um, oppressions to go on, it is its own form of fascism. And so she was making a metaphor between patriarchal family structures and the bigger thing that is looming throughout this book um, you know, the, the, the encroaching fascism, which is, you know, of course for us today, so resonant. So I, I would, that, that word and that, the, that um, theme throughout the book is actually really important and really deliberate. Thank you, yeah. Um, I mean, that was the kind of angle I suppose I like to talk on it with my students as well. Um, but I just felt that sometimes it was such a shock to them at the beginning, that it was kind of almost something that they found very, very difficult to get past. But I, I totally take your, your explanation. Thank you very much. Could I come in just to point out that, yes, it is a very unfortunate word, um, but also when you look at what you would need to qualify for the insult of being a Negro, it, in, it includes wearing city shoes on a mountain hike, <laughs> engaging in conversation on a train with a fellow traveler, speaking to a neighbor from your window, taking off your shoes in the living room and so forth. Now, none of these I think are particularly characteristic of any one racial group. It is certainly an insult, but I mean, d did we notice what he said about Jews? This, this same Professor Levy, uh, he, he's, he tends to scatter his insults so widely. He didn't do the Irish, so that's all right. But he, he certainly scattered his, 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 uh, his insults in, in, in such, a, such a, an ecumenical way that perhaps we needn't tie too much to, 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 this, to this unfortunate phrase. Anyway, that's just a possible, a possible reply. 
Well, I do really appreciate um, Ginsburg's humor. She is very funny and she gets away with a lot of, you know, very dark things because she's also very funny. Yes, yes. And you're going to read a little bit for us in a while, I think, also. There's another question here from Kitty Shields. Did you take on the retranslation because the text was challenging and difficult as opposed to just doing a new translation for a new period? I think that's an interesting an interesting question too. It is. Um, I'd like to think that I was that person who took on challenging and difficult things. Um, but I, uh, I took it on really because um, I, of her, well, of her, um, I'll tell you the story about how it happened. Okay, so I had been pitching to the New York Review book for years, um, different authors I wanted to uh, translate. And it was always a no, a no, a no. And because this had two previous translations, I never even thought of it. I never even considered it. So out of the blue one day, uh, the Edwin Frank, who's the editor at New York Review Books, um, came to me and said, oh, well, what about family lexicon? Would you do that? And it was like I'd won the lottery or I don't know. It was like I was the one book in the world that I would most want to translate because it was sort of the first book I read in Italian when I was young doing my junior year abroad in, in Florence and had so little uh, Italian. Um, and, and the, a professor said, oh, this is very easy to read. So here you are. And of course, it's not at all easy. But um, yeah, so it was, I, I, it was very challenging on a linguistic level and so on. But also, it was a ch an opportunity for me to spend some extraordinarily intimate time with my, someone I consider a mentor um, as a writer. So her, her essays, she, she's an incredible essayist as well. And she has an essay called My Vocation, which when I read, I just realized, okay, I, I can be a writer. Because <laughs> it's just all about um, the vocation of being a writer, a mother, a woman. Uh, and uh, she makes it all seem possible with a lot of humor. Um, so that's, that's how I came to, to translate it. So are there any more, should I, should I read the little bit, uh, Cormac? Well, we have just one other question first, oh, I think okay. from Enrica. And yeah. then, then we could do the reading, yes. Hi. <laughs> um, just want to say, uh, Jenny, your book is just fantastic. It's amazing. I've enjoyed it so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of this uh, book club, I have actually reread the translation. I've read your translation. I've reread the book. So it is uh, great. I wanted to ask you, and um, I want to ask Cormac as well, um, a question about a particular uh, epithet that is used um, by uh, Natalia Ginsburg. Um, to uh, define those who are very slow climbing up the mountain, uh, which is salami. <laughs> so she calls, she calls her, um, uh, the, the father calls uh, uh, the children, old members of the family who are very slow and a bit clumsy, she calls them salami. And uh, now this use of uh, um, gastronomic or, or metaphors related to food is quite common uh, in, in some Italian writers. You know, so you have um, epithets like provolone or mozzarella, for example, that they are used <laughs> uh, for the same purpose. And I note that you translated, um, it must have been a real uh, headache. This is what I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting around to this because you translated this at numbskull. And then you translate it as um, just like a, a few lines below as dolts. So I, I was just wondering how, you know, has it been difficult? And in general, you know, these metaphors um, and these uh, vocabulary uh, related to food, you know, like in, in a metaphorical way, is it difficult to translate? Um, just wanted to know if you had some thoughts uh, about it and you could tell us a little bit about it. Thanks. Yeah, so it's a, it's such a great question. Thank you, Enrica. Um, you know, of course, there's this whole thing about 
getting things that are lost in translation and the food thing, it's so great, right? But if you call, I mean, maybe nowadays, if you called somebody a mozzarella in English, people will get it. But, uh, you know, once upon a time, they really wouldn't. So, um, and if you call somebody a salami in in English, yeah, maybe they, they'd get it, but it would be a little bit of a stretch and it would be a little bit of a, um, of, you know, somebody stopping in the flow of the reading to say, okay, uh, that sounds odd, you know? So those are the kind of choices a translator has to make all the time. So, you know, you lose salami and you use the, lose the food, which is really too bad. But at the same time, you're using, uh, you know, words like numbskull or they have a funny um, quality to them and they have a sort of silly, um, uh, affectionate though at the same time um, quality. So it's, it's those kind of decisions, you know, do I go for salami or do I go for uh, numbskull? Although I have to say, so he, here's another story, if you want to hear one, um, that uh, there's loss in this uh, in this book that is in dialect that has these qualities that you know are many du tr double triple entendres, and you all read about Barbison, right? The uncle and Barbison in in um, in the in dialect has this idea of facial hair, so barba Barbison and. I couldn't figure out what to do with Barbison. So, because I love the way Barbison sounds, but then you lose the facial hair. Uh, uh, previous translations used whiskers or walrus or, but it just didn't sound right. So I did happen to be able to get in touch with um, Ginsburg's son, Carlo, and I asked him about it and I said, you know, what do I do about Barbison? And they, and he wrote back to me and he said, you know what, sometimes in translation, Jenny, it's just best to preserve the language difference. Just leave it Barbison. And I did, and I'm, you know, it was great. And that kind of, that idea of actually leaving things in Italian in the, in the text I actually do that a lot more now in my translations than I did previously. Um, so, you know, I might leave salami now. I don't know. I, you know, you, it's all in the rhythm of what's happening. And I, I think it's working really well. It does work really well with the translation, but I was just like wondering myself, you know, like, is this something that happens? I, I, I presume it happens so often to you. So, it Oh my gosh. I mean, in this book, yeah. I mean, almost every word you had to think about five times, you know, how am I going to do this? And no, luckily, no. I'm obsessive compulsive and, you know, like totally love language. So I don't mind spending five hours on a word. <laughs> so everybody, everybody in the group can think of some word of a culinary sort that would that would suit. But it might always, I don't know. I mean, I would think of cabbage just once if you wanted to insult somebody. I don't know why cabbage would be worse than courgette, uh, but it is if you, want to, if you want to suggest somebody who's a general failure and not getting around enough. But the, the whole thing of cultural uh, and specific language, it's so difficult. And you, as you say, you, you, you must lose sometimes, but then you'll make it up somewhere else. A translation has to be considered in its totality, not did you get every single word the exact equivalent, because that would just, it wouldn't go from language to language. I see a comment in the chat from Eric saying, I seem, I seem to remember father uses numbskull, mother uses rapscallion, so epithets fit characters. And that's interesting too, because you're learning about the, the people. Um, would this be the moment then, since we're on the, the foodie theme, to read a little bit about father at ah. the table and how he tries to get his useless family to prepare the food properly and, <laughs> and fit in with his desires? Absolutely, yes, you're absolutely right. Fitting with the food. Okay, it's just a quick little reading. At mealtimes, my father ate a lot. 
but always in such a hurry that it seemed like he ate nothing because his plate was almost immediately empty again. He was actually convinced that he hardly ate anything and had transmitted this belief to my mother, who was always pleading with him to eat. He, on the other hand, was always yelling at my mother because he thought she ate too much. Don't eat too much, you'll get indigestion. Don't pick at your cuticles, he would thunder at her periodically. My mother did, in fact, have the habit of picking at her cuticles ever since, as a girl at boarding school, she developed a whitlow on her finger that then peeled. All of us, in my father's opinion, ate too much and would have indigestion. Any dish he didn't like, he claimed was unhealthy and indigestible. Dishes he liked, he claimed to be healthy and said they stimulated peris peristalsis. If a dish he didn't like arrived at the table, he would become infuriated. Why did you cook the, cook the meat like this? You know that I don't like it this way. If a dish he liked was prepared only for him, he got angry all the same. I don't want things made specially for me. Don't make anything special for me. I eat everything, he said. I'm not picky like you lot. I don't care in the least about food. One shouldn't talk all the time about eating. It's vulgar, he would thunder if he heard us talking about one dish or another. How I do love cheese, my mother invariably would say whenever cheese was served. And my father would say, how monotonous you are. All you do is repeat yourself. My father liked his fruit very ripe. So whenever one of us came across an overripe pear, we gave it to him. Ah, so you give me your rotten pears. What real jackasses you are, he'd say with a hearty laugh that reverberated throughout the apartment. Then he'd eat the pear in two bites. Walnuts, he'd say as he cracked them open, are good for you. They stimulate peristalsis. You're monotonous too, my mother would say. You repeat yourself too. My father would then take offense. What a jackass, he'd say. You tell me I'm monotonous. What a real jackass you are. At home, we had ferocious arguments over politics, which ended in tantrums, napkins hurled into the air and doors slammed so hard the whole apartment shook. That was during the early years of fascism. I still can't understand what they were arguing about so vehemently since my father and siblings were all against fascism. I asked my siblings recently and none of them could enlighten me on the subject, yet they all remembered those fierce fights it seems to me that my brother Mario, playing devil's advocate with my parents, would defend Mussolini in some way, and this certainly would have enraged my father. Very nice. Thank you. Unreasonable, as unreasonable as your family, as my family, who knows? There's a, a, a nice comment here from Kathleen saying, in Ireland, I suspect sausage would work for salami, but perhaps not in other English-speaking countries. And that ties in with a question. Jenny, Cormac ma mentioned American translation. Any particular specifics re American versus British or Irish? Well, yes, good question. Um, well, of course, there are the spelling differences, but um, those are not, it, it's more what Cormac was talking about earlier. There are cultural references. So that when I was thinking that this comment here about sausage um, would work for salami or the cabbage or courgette. There's so many cultural uh, associations with those. So, you know, you want to, the you want to keep that you're translating culture, a politics, a whole context, a place at the same time as the language. All of those actually really have equal weight. So if you choose, your choices are so, if you choose something outside of the culture, um, even cabbage in Italy, you know, they, they just don't eat it that much, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, 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 or a courgette would, you know, I mean, it, it just, you see, you want to be thinking about those kinds of things all the time. So yeah, am I bringing an American sensibility to this translation? Absolutely, you know, and are my references, the unconscious ones that I, I don't even, you know, realize gonna be there as American? For sure. 
However, you try as hard as possible not to um, necessarily bring the Americanness to it. Um, you want something more in English that refers back to Italy mm. so that you, you can maintain that sense of place and culture. Thank you. Um, yeah, you, you brought up also earlier, Cormac, something about um, on the, along those lines of, so earlier translations used mm -hmm. Scots yes. for the dialect. That's right. Which, again, is another issue. You know, when there's dialect, do you use something else? Or, you know, so it's an, it, they're all interesting choices. Yeah. Um, Judith Wolf says, for the Triestine dialect of Ginsburg's father, I have drawn on Scots vocabulary, rich as it is for in, in terms for dirt and disorder. Uh, and for the Milanese dialect of her mother's stories, I've drawn on Yorkshire syntax. Now, I don't know whether it's that the Scots are so clean that they keep worrying about dirt or whether the Scots are so dirty that, that they have nothing else to talk about. If there are any Scots people here, I apologize to them on either of those two. But yes, the idea that a dialect because a dialect is specific to a country. It isn't something general. And uh, if you put it into a geographical area, then you really have moved it, not just in language, but in, in, uh, in place as well. It's quite, quite tricky. I see another comment here to follow up on Eric's comment about epithets that fit characters. I wanted to ask about the mother's voice, Lydia's, and how it emerges from the book, despite the father's vociferous presence. How did you approach translating Lydia's voice? Uh, I find that question very interesting. Oh, it's a wonderful question. Thank you, Stiliana. And by the way, I just want to mention that um, Stiliana has a incredible journal called Reading and Translation out of um, Oberlin. And next, uh, I think it's the March issue, she has devoted entirely to Ginsburg. So do look out for that. It's going to be amazing. And we, we, you'd find it on, under what? You'd find uh, it maybe somebody... Uh, if, I may, if I may, yes. If yeah. I may say Thank so, you. it's called Reading in Translation. And if you just type readinginTranslation.com, you will find it. It's devoted to reviewing translated literature. And many of the people here are, in fact, contributors. And the whole premise of the journal is that translators review translated literature so they understand the creative and intellectual labor that translators invest into their work. And so that's all I want to say. The February issue is dedicated to Natalia Ginsburg, and it's called Reading Natalia Ginsburg. So thank you, Jenny. And I would love to hear your answer to my question. Yeah, yes. but, but I think you, 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 you might tell us something about it yourself also, the, uh, the Lydia's voice there. So perhaps the two of you could give us the answers, the answers to, those, uh, to that conundrum. Yes, so I love Lydia. So Lydia is the resistance, as far as I'm concerned. Like she is, you know, she is finding how to exist in a world that does not support her in any way. So, uh, she, and it's really hard and she's really trying, and she's made to seem even her frivolous or she goes to the movies all the time or she, but she is keeping it all together. And she is um, with a sense of humor through language, through uh, just being steadfast in holding on to who she is and, and to herself. So um, that voice is just to, as strong to me, if not perhaps stronger than the father's, even though his dominates, she's holding everything together. And I think that's probably generally true. Is that your view too, Stiliana? Yes, I think so too. I noticed that it is her voice that frames the story, at least concludes the, the novel, that it's her story, Barbizon's story is her story. And so it ends on the mother's, on the, the mother's voice. So yes, I do love Lydia as well. And I think it's her presence holds the story together and it's her stories too that tie everything together. Thank but, you. Yes, I was just curious about Jenny and how Jenny thought about it and approached translating her voice. 
I, I see a comment here from Eamon Linsky saying, Beppino has a vociferous presence, but no one pays the slightest bit of attention to him. <laughs> to which some of us would say story of my life, you know, but there you are. And Eric has kindly put up the, the, the uh, reading and translation web address. So that, that's, that is good. Uh, Giuliana points out that cavolo, if you used it in Italian, is used in, the pl in, in place of the swear word cazzo. So that would be one to avoid if you were working from English into Italian. Uh, in Irish, we use, sometimes use Irish words, uh, Irish language words to insult people. Like you can call somebody a nomadon, uh, if, even if you're an English speaker. And oddly, we don't, uh, we, he might take offense more or she might take offense more, although there's a different word for insulting a woman. Uh, than if you had said the same insult in English. Sometimes uh, the languages can distance or soften uh, an insult as well. Well, one of the questions that I put on the, 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 the so-called handout, who is the strongest character, I think has been answered. In, in a way, it's Lydia. It's Lydia who has the, the resistance. And who goes to the movies all through her life? Uh, Natalia herself. Uh, I've just been looking at her biography, uh, biography compiled by her German translator. And she was never happier than when sitting in the movie house. So she picks up things from her mother and uh, you know, the, the, her big sister Ditto has got a very close relationship with the mother. It, 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 could I ask a general question? Is it a happy family? There are no happy families. <laughs> <Talk to me. laughs> Sorry. Hmm. But they have they have loyalties, haven't they? And they have their place yeah. in the family. May I, may I comment? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, my name is Eric. I, I just got done. Jenny, Jenny, Jenny and I know each other, but I just got done writing about the book before uh, the Family Lexicon, um, the Voices in the Evening, and I, I think it's the, the definition of a happy family. Unfortunately, is like it's a place where you get to tell the same story over and over again kind of like the baseline and i noticed that in the excerpt that you read jenny and it's so typical of ginsburg you think it's about food or, or whatever but there's also just about sort of the the texture of being in a family where people tell the same story over and over to each other and they kind of attack each other for it but then they, and they listen to it again and so it, it's not a very like high threshold for for family happiness but i, I think it's the only one that it, that exists um in her books hmm. anyway that's i guess a question statement whatever but Oh, very interesting. That's my, that's my two cents. We, as families, we share each other's stories and we store our stories in each other's memories. And so we are only, um, you know, it, it, we think we're all individuals, but we're really defined by our memory of what happens to our, in within the family and, um, how those memories then play out and that's the over and how we hold on to them and what we do them and what the stories we tell each other ourselves and each other um, about what happened in the past because they're only stories there isn't really what happened in the past and this is what she's also saying um, in in this book and through the repeated stories and all the storytelling and what we are in our present, it's always those stories, which are repeated and repeated and repeated. Mm. Yeah, and not just stories about people themselves, but also the ancestral stories that get passed on from, from earlier generations. Um, I see a comment here from Enrica about Tim Parks, who is obviously a, a great translator. In the introduction, he talks about the two, the, the two colloquial language used by Ginsburg, or at least that's what he was told when he first went to Italy, hinting at the fact that some critics consider her style not adequate to the standards of literary Italian, which in a way is the sort of the, the question that uh, Calvino um, addressed in his, in his comment, I mean, proving how artful she, she was in doing that. However, many Italians don't think much of her writing style. So if there happened to be any Italians in the audience, could I have an expert opinion as to what, I mean, Ginsburg is obviously a great writer in English, but as we know, uh, sometimes people have to migrate before their, before their uh, full qualities are appreciated. So among the Italians here, does anybody have a comment on whether she's too simple, too straightforward, too shabby 
as, uh, as Enrica puts it. Can I say something? Sure. Hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. Ciao, Corma. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a great question, but it requires a very huge uh, reply. I, I will be short and synthetic. Uh, she wrote in 1963, which in Italy is a year in which so many very peculiar books have been published, starting with Luigi Meneghello, The Libera Nosa Mano, Vincenzo Consolo, La Ferita dell'Aprile, Il Maestro di Vigevano, and so many others, because that was a particular season in which after the neorealist uh, moment, very well explained by Calvino in his early 60s preface to the 1947 novel, El Sentiero di Nidi di Ragno, that, so this was the consequence of a reno renovation in the Italian uh, um, literary style and uh, and uh, language so much they went back they start abandoning the literary modalities so traditional and very identical to those of the past embracing new style starting with the family uh, the lexicon is everything for her she's creating a sh family share narrative that is the one that is included that, that family uh, memories. So she's not, uh, she's talking, uh, she's giving voice to the family choir. That's why she's remembering il buco del culo, il bacco del calo del malo, il becco del chelo del melo, because all of them, like in each, it's not question of being happy or unhappy. A family has a private uh, body of many things, mainly a verbal one, that is much, much better uh, it is with each of the members of the family for the rest of their life, rather than very mute, silent, and far away pictures, for example. So she, uh, I remember Eduardo Sanguinetti, when uh, they told very clearly, once that he was lecturing in UCD, actually, in Dublin, I, uh, he told very clearly, uh, Natalia, Natalia Gisburg, I, uh, he was a famous misogynist, as for the women writers in our literature, and he said, no, no, I don't like her because she was too casuale. Yeah, he was an avant-gardiste, he was group 663, so the program is everything and the language and the style must reflect this ideological program, blah, blah, blah. She is, she's, lei era troppo casuale, which is mm -hmm. because of this, uh, the casuality was that she was writing without following an entire project of writing uh, and representing an ideological world as he was doing with his friends and colleagues, etc. So the famous shabby style is true. She's the queen of the anacoluto, all this syntactic, uh, to put Italian syntax upside down uh, without nominating the subject and style with a third person of a verb, whereas the, uh, the, the, the not nominated subject is maybe a plural, etc. So I don't think that it, yes, can be seen as a shabby style, depends on the point of view. She was, non, but was not that. She was highly representative of the innovation of Italian stylistical and linguistic talking literature of those times. So yep. dialect come first, the family uh, neologistic, uh, eh? il, il bacco del calo del malo is, a, is just a representative point because it was an invention of his own brother, no? Mm -hmm. And also I think the book is a great sample of understatement. She wrote it when she was an elder lady after having paid such a price in her life because she was highly reserved. But uh, I mean, she's saying, very humble things of a family that was an immensely great family. We had such an impact in Italian mm -hmm. cultural and intellectual history. Lydia was the sister of Drusilla Tanzi, the, 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 the wife to Eugenio Montale. I mean, they were everywhere. They, everyone was passing in their houses, etc. But she's keeping silent, as Cormac, you have just underlined at the very beginning. And I mean, the, the, this is also a great sample of not frequent Italian understatement. That's it. Thank you. There, there's a, uh, just a question uh, here. Those books that you mentioned from 1963, Vincenzo Consolo, 
What la ferita dell'aprile is la, not translated. La ferita, la I will write it down. Aprile, the wound of April, but it's not translated. No, it's not translated. Okay. And Quindi then you, Meneghello, Meneghello. Libera nos amalo. Libera not nos amalo. Yes, that seems to be in Latin. I don't know why you're mentioning it. And uh, what else? It is, it is, it is an ironical uh, yeah, okay. uh, title. Libera yeah. nos amalo because he was born in Malo, capital N, which is a small village in Veneto. <laughs> so we, have one, we, we have one in County Cork as well, actually. So, <laughs> and he, did, did, did you mention the other one? You mentioned Sanguinetti, who's a poet uh, and an academic. Sanguinetti? Sanguinetti has been translated by Podrick Daly here in Ireland. He's, he's been translated into English. Um, I'm looking here at, um, oh, uh, Ursula says she was an obsessive rewriter, but to remove rather than to add. So not wishing to elaborate, but to pare down what she had written. That's, that's very interesting. She said she could, she could cut and edit when she was writing, but she couldn't come back to it years later, which I thought was interesting. Uh, Natalia Carvajosa says, I, re I read or I, re I read Ginsburg in Spanish. From the beginning, I found her style so unique and so striking, deceptively simple sotto voce, implying so much more than what she says. I found it irresistible 30 years ago, same as today, and also in her essays. Well, she is a, a very fine essay writer. Will there be any creative writers in the house who have been influenced or interested in, in um, Ginsburg, not just as a subject of study or translation, but you know that, that, that their own work has been in some way shaped or influenced even, even by reaction from, to, to this particular writer. Very Cormac, can I come in for a second about the style? I wanted to yep. add something to that question because like I, I think you know like Juliana has um, answered you know, in a wonderful way and you know like I uh, I think, you know, like I understand, of course, you know, like from an Italian literature point of view, but my question was also a question for the translators, because, um, it, you know, in a sense, uh, the idea that uh, Ginsburg's language is uh, uh, informal, or it might be uh, the incorrect Italian, if you want, you know, like Marico's problems from a grammatical and syntactic point of view to translate uh, tricky uh, morphosyntactic structures that are hard to translate uh, into English because like they might be misunderstood. This was like the sense of <laughs> my question, uh, uh, you know, for the translators, but I don't know if uh, if yourself and and maybe Jenny can can comment on it. Jenny. Oh, it's, it's I'm sorry, Enrica. Will you say that again? <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. really so I had asked a question. You know, like I was I kind of made reference to Tim Parks and what he said about uh, uh, Natalia Ginsburg's Italian being uh, kind of incorrect. You know, like or a little bit. Uh, yeah local to informal etc and there are critics that uh, thought of uh, Natalia Ginsburg's style uh, might be uh, in fact you know incorrect or not up to certain literary standards uh, and then Juliana remarked you know like how she made use of certain forms of the anacoluto you know certain uh, you know gr grammatical or morphosyntactic structures and I was just you know, they might uh, be tricky to translate because uh, of the colloquial nature, and they might in fact be misunderstood by a translator. One has to reread them a couple of times to uh, find the right tone or the right uh, equivalent, if we want to talk about equivalent, but we never really well, oh, Yes, yeah. um, no, absolutely. Correct. So I thought Juliana's answer was so brilliant, but from the translator's um, point of view, I see what you're saying, yes. Um, you know, there is so much that gets lost in translation, for sure. And certainly there are so many, uh, for example, um, you know, she was a, tra uh, Ginsburg was a translator of Proust too, right? So she, what she's bringing and she, what she's bringing and putting into every sentence is so, has so many references and repercussions and semiotics and, and you know, a translator's just never gonna get that, all of that, but then the translator is gonna bring whatever she has to that translation. And then that's why every, in my opinion, every translation becomes its own work because you're going to lose some of that 
subtlety and references and context that was there in the original, but then you're going to get something entirely else with the translator's interpretation. So that's, good, that's how I would answer that. I, I realize yes. I've been keeping William Wall um, waiting there for a moment. Please, please come in. Uh, I think I'm unmuted. That's good, yes. Um, well, firstly, I'd like to say, Jenny, that I, I really love the translation. Um, uh, it's stunning, really, I think. Uh, extremely modern, and at the same time, it captures the spirit of the book, I think, perfectly. Um, I've been struck since the beginning by the tension between a book which is more or less completely focused on the domestic sphere, but which is written by a woman who was a major writer and um, uh, I suppose a public intellectual, um, a woman who stood against fascism and who espoused the anti-fascist cause at a time when fascism saw a woman's place as very definitely in the home or in the bed. And you've remarked on his relevance for the present. And uh, I know this is not strictly about translation, but I really would like you to speak a little bit more about that if, if we have time. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so this idea that the domestic sphere is somehow not part and parcel of the political public sphere is a false dichotomy. And this book is about that. This book is saying, yeah, he, you know, everything that's going on in here is a metaphor for everything that's going on out there. And if you want to know how it works, you know, here I, I'm showing you how it, it all starts very domestic. And then what is happening out in the big world? It's the same thing, really. It's who's getting, whose voices are getting heard, who's getting slurred what stories are being told, what we're telling each other again and again. Um, and she's just using the domestic sphere. She's, you know, really focusing in hard on domestic to show how integral it is to every part of life. There is no dichotomy, really. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the whole point. I mean, I think that's a really strong message of her book. And I think it gets missed a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I agree with you completely about that. I, I think the, the, um, the idea of narratives, of um, the kind of narratives that we tell each other is particularly relevant in, in today's, um, in, I mean, you drew the connection with the election and so on and the kind of narratives that we tell each other about um, the domestic sphere or the political sphere are uh, absolutely crucial to how we understand um, so society and, uh, and politics in general. But it's also what happens in her own family. And it was so creepy for me to, to actually be really deep in this as it was going on around me, is that the narratives also keep us from seeing what is going on in the world around us. So we use the stories, we use our family, we use it all to hide and also to excuse. So we can say negrigura uh, and all offhanded and be excused and it doesn't really matter. It's kind of funny, it doesn't really hurt anybody. You know, or, or oh, he, Mussolini, he's a buffoon. He'll never get to power, you know, yeah, he's too much of an idiot. You know, all these things that, were she's saying in the book i'm hearing in my own family you know about what's happening in america so you know she had a big point to make yes thank you she had the powers the powers of prophecy i, I am there's a there's a very well as primo levy said mm -hmm. if it can happen once it can always happen again indeed so, there's a very good book um, written by a woman who lived in ireland it's called uh, The Past is Myself uh, by Christabel Bielenberg. And she married a German in, in, in the 1930s. He took her to a public rally to laugh at a ridiculous little man who was jumping up and down and squeaking, not unlike, I can't remember the name of one of, one of your presidents. And uh, he said, well, I can tell you one thing, the Germans will never fall for that nonsense. So <laughs> we can't be, we certainly, we can't be too careful. Um, 
Now, we're getting close to the end of time. There's so much more that could be said about this. What, what or whom have we excluded so far? I, I see a hand still up from William, but I'm not sure. No, I don't see his image. No, Anyone? no, I, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not waving. Okay. Right. I may be drowning. You're drowning, okay. Any other, uh, any other comments at this point? Well, I'd like to thank everybody for reading the book and coming with their ideas and listening to, to everybody else. I hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly hugely enjoyed going back over it. And uh, well, perhaps I should, I should ask um, Ethna to come back in and advertise the next <laughs> <laughs> next uh, session of the book club. Thank you so much Cormac and I, I just would like to say huge thanks. I think there were 75 people here which is a record for our book club and um, I just really would like to say a big thank you to you and to Jenny um, on behalf of the centre that was the most most enlightening and entertaining discussion. I really enjoyed it um, I know that some of the people here um, you know will have been reading Natalia Ginsburg for the very first time so I think we will be dashing out <laughs> to order more of her work. Um, so thank you for that, that lovely introduction. I just wanted to say, for I know there's many people here who are very interested in Italian culture and literature, and there are two very important events at the Italia being hosted by the Italian Cultural Institute here in Dublin uh, later this month. One is about the work of the young Somali Italian novelist uh, Ijaba Shego this Thursday evening. And another book by Stiliano Milkova, who I think is here this evening. I heard her voice earlier. Um, she'd be talking about a new book that she's written about the work of Elena Ferrante, which I think will be a very popular event with Enrica Ferrara. Ferrara and I think uh, the translator Anne Goldstein will also be there. So that'll be a very interesting translation event on the 23rd of February. And there are more details on their website. But Back to the centre, we do we have a lunchtime event, event this Thursday coming about contemporary Greek and, and Irish literature. Uh, in March, we'll be hosting an event about translating great Russian literature. Uh, the book titles for our March, April and May book clubs are already up on the website. Um, these are just a few of the events of the very many that we have planned for the coming months. So please keep an eye on our website and sign up to our mailing list if you're not already on it. Um, I'll share a screen in a minute that will show you our website with all the details. Um, and it will also give details about how to become a friend or patron of our centre if you're interested in that. I'd just like to say thank you again to Jenny and to Cormac and to all of you for coming along this evening. Um, it was a real pleasure hosting this. So bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>